Okay, um, I'm here, my name is Spencer Lyon. I'm here to talk about the work I do with Julia and applying it to my economics research. Um, I'll give you a brief sketch of what we're going to talk about. I'll quickly give a bio about myself, and then I'm going to talk about a project that I'm working on called Quant Econ. Uh, I'll give you an overview, and then we'll do an example of how to work with that library. And then I'm going to talk a bit more about what a typical modern economic model looks like. What are its features? What are the characteristics? Why are they difficult or easy to solve? And then we'll go over a few more examples uh, as long as we have time. Um, so a little about myself. I'm between my second and third year of my, ec of my PhD program in the economics department at NYU. I live in New York with my wife and my two kids. We're expecting our third in September. Um, I have a physics and economics undergrad background at BYU. And programming background, I started with Mathematica, used Python for a few years. Now I use Julia most of the time, but sprinkle in some other things if, I, uh, if it's applicable to the problem. Um, so yeah, now we'll move. I'm going to talk now about the Quant Econ project. So Quant Econ, what is it? It's an organization run by economists for economists with the aim of coordinating distributed development of high quality open source code for all forms of quantitative economic modeling. That's a quote from our, our, the home page for our website. And I think it captures well what we're all about. Um, it's a project coordinated by Thomas Sargent at NYU as well as John Staszewski at Australia National University. There's a, a team of five core developers right now with a few other um, core contributors, and we're supported financially by the Sloan Foundation. Um, so, so what is it? It's formally composed of two main components. First, there's a website that contains about 40 different lectures or textbook chapters that teach programming as well as economics. And they're geared towards either advanced undergraduates or early graduate students or even practitioners and researchers who are looking to brush up on a certain skill or topic. Um, so that's the first half. The second half is the code libraries written in Python and Julia. And not only do they implement all the examples and other things from the website, but they, uh, they go beyond that. There's some more, they're geared towards high performance, economic computing. I guess that's a, a bad trigger word. Uh, efficient economic computing. Um, the third unofficial commitment is that we've kind of landed in is we're facilitating collaboration across different communities. And some examples of how this is happening, we're working with various government agencies. Uh, we've worked with the IMF, the New York Fed, the Bank of England, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, um, as well as we're working with actively with the Julia community and the SciPy community and then other academics that are uh, involved in economic research. One interesting thing I want to highlight on this point is we're actually starting to help the, the New York Federal Reserve translate one of their huge models they use to do forecasting and uh, sensitivity analysis. They're moving it over from MATLAB to Julia and we're helping assist them in that role. So that's an exciting project. It'll be open source and posted on GitHub when the code's finally complete. But as of now, we're kind of in the beginning stages of that transition. So stay tuned for that. So I want to briefly show you what the website looks like. So you land on the website, and it explains a little bit about the background. And then you see that we can choose either a Julia track or a Python track. Um, and the way they're structured is one part of each track that says this is the basics of the language as well as the tools that are common in economics or data analysis in each language. And then after that, there's a core set of introductory economic examples that build up foundational mathematical principles as well as outline basic economics. And then there's another section that is more advanced examples. So we see this first part is the basics of programming in Julia, and then these introductory examples and the advanced ones. Sections two and three of the website are the same on the Python and Julia sides. We just show different code examples. Um, all the code examples, if you choose the Julia side, will be shown in Julia rather than Python and vice versa, but the text of the, the chapter is going to be the same. Um, 
we have a this uh, introduction to programming in Julia is fairly extensive. We go over basics, starting from step one, how to get everything installed and set up. We also show some quick examples to kind of motivate people to be excited about it. Then we have an essentials chapter where we cover the basics of data types in Julia, reading data in and out, iterators, functions, and then we get on to types and methods and multiple dispatch. And finally, we just summarize this chapter or this section with an overview of the, the libraries we depend on at QuantEcon. Um, so that's a little bit about the website. Um, so right now you can see that there's between 30 and 40 lectures already there. And here's just a list. I know it's way too long to see, but a list of other lectures that we're cons currently considering adding to the website. And we'll eventually make it into the, uh, the code library also. And the list goes on for a really long time. Um, so we have lots of work ahead of us. Um, okay, so now let's talk, so that's the website, now the libraries. For, they started as teaching tools, and they were mainly the implementations of the different models and methods that were found in the website lectures. But now we're kind of trying to transition into more performance-oriented tools that researchers and practitioners can use. The Julia and Python versions of the library are both first-class citizens. It's not like one is inferior to the other. Um, and at this point, they have the same functionality, but that may not hold in the long run. And the reason is we ha I have a lot of tools that I've written in Julia that aren't replicated on the Python side. So if anything, in the near future, we'll see the Julia functionality will be extended beyond that of the Python. Um, and all our code's open source. It's community developed on GitHub. Um, here's an overview of kind of what the, uh, what the library provides. So. We see here all these Q and W functions. These are all getting quadrature nodes and weights for different quadrature schemes, as well as evaluating the, the approximate integral using these schemes. Um, and then the type section is more uh, helpful. So we have basic statistic things. We have types to represent autoregressive moving average models, various distributions that weren't in the distributions package, surprisingly. Um, other classic linear quadratic control problems, a robust version of that. We have a, a tool set for analyzing Markov chains or discrete state Markov chains. Um, and in addition to that, we have a, a collection that's going to be growing more, but of classic models in economics that we've implemented and provided the solution for. Um, and I'm going to skip looking at the editor. So now, I've given you a background on what the project is. It started as a Python shop, and then we moved to Julia, or we added Julia's support about a year ago. And so I just wanted to explain a little bit why we wanted to move to Julia. And first, it's open source, which is great. It's, Python has that in common, but we weren't going to move to something closed. Um, and, and I feel like, at least for me, there's a natural syntax for expressing the types of models we work with. For example, linear algebra in Python or Julia it just is so much more readable and easier to use. That's, that's not a, a deal breaker by any means, but it's convenient and nice. Um, it, it's fast and parallel, which is a big deal now because the models that uh, economists are writing down now are getting bigger and more complicated, and it takes time to solve them. So having an efficient implementation of the models is, is crucial. And then it's flexible and powerful. We can represent abstract modeling types and still maintain decent performance. Um, so I'm going to show a little example of how to interact with the library and how we might uh, actually extend it. Okay. So the quant econ, we saw a little bit in here that we have um, a module quant econ, and what this has is just a collection of tools that we use that do various things. And then we also have a different module that's quant econ dot models, and that's where the models are implemented. Um, we're going to explore a little bit more of the model part of that of the library right now, and this is code I'm currently working on, so the design may change, but for now this is what we're working with. Um, 
So how do we represent a model? Well, they're all subtypes of this abstract model type. Um, and if a, a subtype of abstract model conforms to the quant econ model interface, there will be automatic solution methods implemented for that model. And all the interface consists of is two methods. Um, we ask people to provide an initial values function for a given model. And what this does is it returns something of arbitrary type t that provides an initial guess for the solution of the model. Uh, this could be a discretized version of some policy function or a value function. Uh, and, and then we ask him to implement what's called a Bellman operator. Um, and I'm going to explain a little more what this word Bellman means in a second when I show you an example of a model. But what this does is it helps you move, perform one iteration on this solution. So we ask him to propose a solution and tell us how to do one iteration, and then we can kind of take care of the rest. Um, and the way we do it, we, we call this VFI, or value function iteration function, uh, on the model, starting from the initial values that they gave us. Um, so I want to give an overview of a very simple and standard model that you'd see in most first year graduate courses in economics. And then we're going to show how we implement that and hook it into our quant econ model interface. Um, so we're going to start, we're going to, it's a model from McCall, he presented in 1970, so it's pretty old, but it shows, it's an illustrative example of how you might interact with the library. Um, so here's the setup. An unemployed worker is searching for a job. And every period he gets an offer to accept a job at wage W, and he's going to continue to earn that wage for the rest of his life. We're not modeling wage growth or anything like that, it's just a static if he accepts the job after, he gets that um, income for the rest of his life. And each of these is going to be drawn from some distribution F, where capital F represents the, the CDF, or the cumulative distribution of the wage offers. Um, each period that the worker remains unemployed, he's going to earn some unemployment compensation of C, just another constant. Um, so what is the worker trying to do? He seeks to maximize the expected value of the sum from starting now at t equals zero to infinity of beta to the t of y, beta to the t times yt, where y is going to be his income in the period, either c if he's still unemployed, or w if he's accepted a job at offer w. And beta in zero one is some discount factor. It incorporates the notion that people care more about the present than they do the future. So when beta is less than one, the smaller beta is, we say the less patient the agent is, where he prefers to have his income shifted towards today versus uh, later in the future. Um, so now we're going to say let V of W be the value of an unemployed worker who is deciding whether to accept the offer to work at wage W. Uh, and we're going to write this value recursively. We're going to write it as the maximum of two options. Either he can accept the offer in which case he earns wage W forever. And if we just solve for the, this geometric sum, plugging in a constant W here, we get W over one minus beta. If he chooses to reject the offer, he gets the expected value of a new offer W prime tomorrow. So we're gonna integrate over this value function over all W primes across the distribution of W primes. And this equation right here is commonly called the Bellman equation. And one of the key features is it writes the value today of being in a particular state as a function of that state, a function of controls that the agent chooses, as well as the value of entering a new state tomorrow. Um, so how would we implement this now that we have a, a basic understanding of the model? For, we could define uh, our subtype of abstract model like this. We could have some vector w of uh, wage offers that this agent might receive, and some vector f of probabilities of receiving a particular wage offer. Then we need to keep track of this discount factor, as well as unemployment compensation. And then this value of accepting is going to be a vector, but it's going to be constant over time. Because um, remember, the value of accepting at any given offer w is just w over 1 minus beta. So we're just going to keep track of that, because it's going to be constant throughout our problem. Uh, and then we'll just have a constructor here 
that uh, defines default parameter values and then ensures that this value of accepting is actually what the model says it should be. Uh, then we need to define the methods that correspond to the interface. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a new method to the model that init values function. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to guess that the initial value or the initial uh, value for the value function, the initial guess for that, we're just going to say it's the value of accepting the average offer in the distribution. Take the mean over the, the wages and then we divide by one over one minus the discount factor. And then we're just going to repeat that as many times as we need to. Oh, I should say, we're representing this value function. If we have n elements in our vector of possible wage offers, this value function is going to be a vector of length n, because there's a distinct value for each wage offer. So when we define the initial value as just the mean, the value of the mean wage, we're just going to repeat that n times. Uh, and then the, uh, we need to add a new method to the Bellman operator function, and this is pretty simple. If we're given a particular uh, vector representing our guess for the value function, we can compute the value of rejecting the offer, which is going to be this compensation for unemployment, plus beta times this, uh, this is approximating that integral. We're just going to multiply the, uh, the value at each w times the probability of that w and sum them up. So this is a very rough approximation of the integral we're doing right over here. Um, and then we'll just take the element-wise maximum between this pre-computed value of accepting the offer and now the value of rejecting it. Uh, then it's really easy to solve the model now. What we can do, we can make a new, uh, we can instantiate it. Uh, we can make a new instance of our type. We can call this value function iteration method. It's going to iterate for us. And due to some th theory in the background, we know that this value function is going to be a contraction mapping, which ensures that there's a unique fixed point. So if we just continue to iterate, no matter where we start in the state space with our guess for the value function, if we continually iterate on the Bellman opera, we're guaranteed to converge to a unique solution. So all that the... Uh, this VFI method does is it just applies the Bellman operator um, a lot of times until it reaches some convergence where it's not changing significantly from one iteration to the next. Um, and then we can visualize what this solution looks like. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I didn't run the other cells, but we can still see what we wanted to. So we can visualize what the solution looks like down here at the bottom. We've just thrown up a quick plot. Um, so we see that up to this red line, the value function is constant. And this is because we're rejecting the offer. And at this red line, there's a cutoff threshold that says, if any wage offer happens to be above the red line, we're going to accept it. And anything below, we're going to reject. And we're, we're going to remain unemployed. So it's constant here, because this is just the value of collecting unemployment insurance today plus the value of being unemployed again tomorrow, which, again, is also another constant. And then up here, we start to move linearly with the offer, because we're now just computing that w over 1 minus beta for everything in this range. So that's just some intuition behind why the solution looks the way it does. OK, so that was an extremely simple example that's not characteristic of what economic models actually look like today, but it is characteristic of how you might work with this uh, quant econ package. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit more about what do models look like today? How is it different from the, the type of thing we just saw? Um, my advisor, Tom Sargent, likes to say, an economic model is a probability distribution over outcomes. Uh, and that that's a, it's a pretty deep statement. Uh, I still don't totally understand what he means, but I understand more as time goes on. Let's talk about uh, how I view economic models to today. Economic models used to be cute. They were solved via pen and paper. They were very elegant. Uh, they had nice closed form solutions. And building upon this strong foundation, we were able to it just laid a nice foundation to build on and do extensions. But most of the interesting and novel or new extensions today uh, are accompanied by some serious computational difficulties. It's not easy to write a model that 
one, hasn't been done before, and two, actually matches real world data or is interesting for one reason or another. And I'll try to describe how I perceive the current landscape of the models that uh, people are writing down now. What are some of the features? Uh, they're dynamic, and by that I mean that the choice of the current period controls impact the opportunities in the future. So it's not a static problem where we solve an optimization, where we just optimize over some function that's constant. It's going to be a direct, what we choose today is going to directly impact the value we have tomorrow and the opportunities we face. Uh, models are stochastic. Agents are facing uncertainty in one form or another, which means we need to really take expectations seriously. And this can be difficult depending on the stochastic environment we've set up for ourselves. Uh, they're, they're general, and what I mean by that is the term general equilibrium, meaning that we're modeling both sides of the economy. In the example we just showed, we we're only modeling the decision of some unemployed agent who exogenously received wage offers. Uh, that's not how things are usually done. Usually you have to model both sides of the economy and then solve for some set of prices or other uh, intermediary variables that allow both sides to be happy. So you're solving a joint fixed point problem for, for multiple sets of agents. Um, most models are recursive. We, we saw that a little bit in the model that we talked about a minute ago, where the value of being in a particular state of the world today is a function of the agent's expected value tomorrow. And that expectation has taken over both the stochastic variables in the model as well as the controls that the agent chooses in the current period. Uh, and then one other thing, that these models are constrained. We've been able to derive, as an economic community, a lot of utility or a lot of benefit from very simple models that allow us to understand the mechanics of what certain modeling features would lead to certain outcomes. Um, but these types of insights are kind of running out. We, we're needing to add more frictions and more, diff or more uh, advanced modeling concepts in order to match real world data and come up with new insights. But adding these frictions comes with a significant increase in the computational difficulty of the problem. Um, so what are some common tools that economists use? Um, when we write down our models, uh, invariably going to be some function of deep underlying parameters, and we need a way to estimate those. We could use generalized method of moments or Monte Carlo methods or pretty much anything else from the field of econometrics. Um, another common thing that needs to be done is we're, we're solving, so that v function that we saw for earlier, v object, was a function. So we're solving an optimization problem in functional space. And we need a way to approx those, approximate the functions. So we typically do that via some interpolation scheme. Uh, almost all these problems are optimal control problems, so there's some notion of optimization or root finding incorporated in most of these solution techniques. And typically, either as part of the solution itself or an after stage of computing some sorts of statistics or doing comparative statics, we need to do some stochastic simulation. So these are some common tools um, that economists need to have in their toolkit. And we provide a few of them right now in the Quant Econ Library, but there's a whole lot of things that we're currently working on uh, that are going to be moved over shortly. They're, they're going to become part of the library shortly. Um, I'm going to skip this. OK, so what does that mean? We showed, I showed a super simple example of a very easy model that you can almost solve by hand. Uh, and then I talked about how no models today are like that. So what am I trying to, what am I trying to ta tell you guys? I'm saying that now, more than ever, economists are searching for and using cutting edge technology and software to do their work. They rely on good tools in order to solve the models that they write. So I feel like this is a kind of a perfect storm of circumstance for communities like Julia or SciPy and the academic economists to start collaborating and working together. And what I want to do now, if I have time, should I? When, when should I end? 15 minutes. Oh, 15 more minutes? Oh, great. I have time to do this. So now we're, I'm, I'm going to look at one set of tools that I'm developing that would be applied to these more difficult models. And this is going to be, um, yeah. Let's move on to it. So 
I'm going to talk about a function approximation because this is so central to most of our algorithms. And what I'm going to talk about is a different related library that's called CompiCon. Um, a little background, MATLAB is the status quo or the choice, the language of choice for most academic economists right now and researchers. And CompiCon is a popular MATLAB toolbox for doing <coughs> computational economics and it accompanies a book by Mario Miranda and Paul Fackler. Uh, and I, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues about this, and many of them mentioned that they'd like to move on to a different language than MATLAB, but they can't because they rely heavily on CompEcon. And I said, well, what, what parts of it do you rely on the most? And they say it's mostly the function approximation parts. So as a first step toward helping people in that um, mindset to be willing to try out a different language. I've moved over all the uh, function approximation parts of the CompEcon library. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, so some features. Why do people like it? Well, you can, it's interpolation over arbitrary number of dimensions that utilize sparse matrices and tensor products to help with efficiency. Um, you, it has support for computing an arbitrary order of derivative or integral on the approximated function, which is really important because lots of times when we're doing, we need to take the expectation over the derivative of something. That shows up in a lot of our first order conditions. So being able to take derivatives of our, our interpolants is, is crucial. And then there's nice support for a B-spline basis or Chebyshev polynomials or piecewise linear basis functions. And you can mix and match which basis you're using along each dimension. So if you happen to know that you need more control over where the nodes are uh, along a particular dimension, you may choose to do B splines because you have a bit more control over optimal node allocation than you do when you use Chebyshev polynomials. Because there, there are proven optimal nodes to pick when you're using Chebyshev polynomials. Um, so it's usually a bad idea to differ from that. OK, before I go into what the code looks like, I want to talk about the theory, because it's important to understand the concepts we're trying to capture in the code. It's built around three core concepts. The first is that we need some functional basis for each dimension of our interpolant. And what this basis specifies is we need to pick a family of basis functions along the dimension, B splines, Chebyshev polynomials, linear piecewise splines. Uh, we also need to specify the domain along the dimension, the bounds. We're going to be constructing a hypercube. And then we need to pick interpolation nodes or a grid along that domain where we're going to say that the function needs to hold with equality. Second concept is we need to be able to represent the basis structure. And by this I mean we represent the evaluation of each of the basis functions at each of the nodes along that dimension. So suppose along dimension one we have Eight, function, eight basis functions and 10 nodes, we're going to represent this by a 10 by 8 matrix. Uh, and then we're going to do this for all the different dimensions. And then to combine them up into our n-dimensional interpolator, we're just going to take the tensor product between them. And this is a subtle point. There's actually three different ways we represent this basis structure in CompEcon, and which one you pick can have a, a significant impact on the performance of your interpolation scheme. And finally, the third main component is we need a coefficient vector. And what this does is it maps us from the domain of the basis into the real line or into the space of the function we're trying to approximate. Um, so now we're going to talk, how are we going to represent these types to Julia, or these concepts to Julia? Uh, we're going to have a, a family of types that help us represent the basis or help us construct one. We have this abstract type, the basis family, which is just going to be one of linear, Chebyshev, B-spline. We also have an abstract basis parameters. And what this does is it holds the, necess the fields hold the necessary information to construct a basis of a given type. So for splines, we need to have a knot vector or breakpoints, as well as we need to know the order of the spline, and we need to know the domain where it lives on, and as well as how many functions we like how many basis functions we want on our interval. Um, and then these two things help us define this immutable basis type that uh, is parameterized over the number of basis functions. 
And the fields here just list the, uh, the different elements of the basis parameters along each dimension and kind of keep track of those for us. Uh, the second group of types help us represent this basis structure. So we have another abstract type that is which, which type of basis structure are we working with? And it could be one of the tensor type, direct, or expanded. And I'll go into a little more detail on what those is when I show you some code. And then we have a basis structure that has a, a type parameter that's one of these three types. And the fields on that store these basis matrices that we talked about, how it's every function at each node along the dimension, it stores those, as well as information about which order of derivative or integral we're currently working with. What do these matrices correspond to? Are they the function themselves, first, second, third, mixed partial derivatives, and so on? And finally, the last type is a kind of a convenience type. It's just an interpolant that holds the coefficient vector that we've uh, extracted, as well as the basis itself, and it knows how to evaluate at arbitrary points along the domain. So I'm going to show you quickly what this code looks like, the original MATLAB code, and then I'm going to talk about why Julia's notion of types uh, made this code a lot easier to think about and represent. What time was it I supposed to end again, Jihan? Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Oh. 10.30? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Looks like, is the dark syntax okay? Can people see that? Okay. So the first set of functions we're working on is called fundef. And what this does is it defines the basis. So it's, what it's going to take, it's going to take uh, a variable number of arguments, and then it does a whole bunch of preprocessing. If you only get one argument, throw some error. If you get two and it's not the right thing, throw other errors and so on. So you can imagine all of this stuff can just be caught by multiple dispatch. If we don't get the right methods, if we don't get the right arguments, there's just a no method error. We don't have to manually do all this type, just checking on the input arguments. Um, so then what happens after that? So, so what are in these variable arguments? Well, <laughs> a whole bunch of stuff. Um, if, it ha if we're wanting to construct a basis for a Chebyshev polynomial, we need to know the order of the polynomial as well as the bounds of the domain. And from that, this routine will construct an, a node vector for the interpolation nodes, as well as talk to us about how we might evaluate each of the basis functions. And we're going to have similar ideas or data that we need for the B-splines or the linear interpolation. And what happens is it's going to be a variable number of MATLAB cell arrays that specify the type of basis and then each of the parameters needed to construct a basis of that type. And it's going to just take these all as a variable number of cell arrays. And no, depending on how many you give it, that's the dimensionality of the basis you're going to get out in the end. And I, I don't want to dive into how this, too many details. I just want you to get a, picture, uh, a visual of what the code looks like. Because it's going to look quite different on the Julia side. And it'll be a little easier. So what they're doing is they need to construct uh, a string that contains the code to evaluate or to construct a basis of a given type. Uh, and then they evaluate that string. And again, you can imagine that this is easily taken care of by multiple dispatch. So we're going to see how that works. After we have the basis, we need to represent the, the, uh, the basis matrices. And we do that uh, over here. So what this does is it takes in this basis that we just constructed in the previous function, and then zero or more of the following arguments. X is where in the domain do we want to evaluate the basis functions. Order is only applicable to splines. It says which order of spline. Do you want it to be linear, quadratic, cubic, 10th degree for some reason? And then this B format thing. This was, I talked about briefly that there are three ways that we represent the basis structure, either in a tensor product format, or the direct product format, or an expanded format. And, and this, this last argument specifies which of those we want to select. Um, so here's what we do. This basis structure, the output is going to be this, this B. And we see that it's just going to be a MATLAB struct 
with fields for the vowels. These are going to be the underlying basis matrices. Order is going to be the, uh, the order of derivative that these basis matrices correspond to. And then this format is uh, one of tensor, direct, or expanded. Um, and so you can see we do a lot of this type checking. Is x this type? Well, if it is, do that. Otherwise, do this. Um, is x a cell array? And are we matching this string tensor as B format? So we can see, again, a lot of type checking that as you can imagine, it's going to be taken care of by multiple dispatch for us. We're not going to have to do all this. Is x, does it happen to be a, a matrix or a vector? Um, and then we do this. It's the same kind of thing that we, we were doing in the previous function. We have a switch statement over this format that we want to be in. And then we're going to construct uh, the call, a call to evaluate the basis functions of a very particular type. And then we're going to populate our, our vals array with that. Um, and then one other thing that's important is being able to convert from one representation to another. So if we have a tensor product representation, this is the most efficient. What it does is it only calculates the uh, evaluation of each of the functions at each of the nodes uh, independently and doesn't combine them at all. It's super efficient because we're not copying data to expand for repeated points. We're just doing it one at a time. And from there, we can convert to direct, which is the next uh, step down in the memory efficiency ladder. And what this does is it's going to expand along the rows, meaning it's going to fill in at each of the different basis functions the, uh, the product of the number of points along each dimension. So if we have n five points in dimension one and six in dimension two, the tensor product would have five rows in one matrix and six in the other. The direct would have 30 rows in both. Uh, and finally, we would do, we can go from either tensor or direct up to expanded. And what this says is it not only do, um, uh, does the tensor product along the nodes, but it does along the functions. So we're going to be taking Cartesian products along both dimensions. And this is a natural way to think about it, because then solving for the coefficient vector is just a least squares problem. We just use the backslash operator because everything's aligned, but it's the least efficient memory-wise for representing them. And we need a way to convert from one to the other. And this will be the last thing I'll show you in the MATLAB, and then I'll quickly show you what the code looks like in the Julia, even though we won't have very much time to spend on it. I'm actually going to move on. I lied. OK. So here's what we do in the Julia side. So this code is going to replace the first method we looked at, where it constructed all these strings um, and then evaluated them and did all this error checking and stuff. So this functionality is being replicated on this side. So here we construct this abstract basis family, and then we tell it which of the, the three basis families we're currently supporting. Um, and then we're going to have this other type that helps us keep track of what the different parameters are for each family of basis function. So we have this for the Chebyshev, the splines, and the linear interpolants. And then here's just some code that, when I initially did this, I did like a direct port from MATLAB to Julia, and then I've slowly been moving everything and organizing it into my new type system. So here's some code that I can go back and forth between the two for testing purposes. Um, and then finally, here's my basis. I, you notice each field here is a vector, and the ith element of each vector is going to be the corresponding parameter along that dimension. Um, as you can see, we're not having to do any of these type checks. They're just all, uh, they're all taken care of for us by multiple dispatch, which cleans up the code considerably. We're not, we're not worried about manually checking for things as much. Um, The time. Okay, I'm going to stop here. But yeah, thanks for uh, for listening. I guess I'll just stop. Time for a couple of questions. There's a package from a guy in Munich called Finmetrics. I wonder how that complements or Fin metrics. the work that you're doing. I don't know that package. I'll have to look it up. 
thin metrics. No, what, uh, what does the package do? It's an econometrics package. Econom okay, so I don't have many pure econometrics routines implemented, so there's probably not a whole lot of overlap. The, the tools I'm developing are more numerical analysis rather than specifically tied to econometrics. So I imagine they'll be complementary rather than overlapping. Um, uh, one more question. Has your package got any Bayesian stuff in yet? Not yet. I, I do have a, a, a collection of Bayesian tools that we're going to be looking to, uh, to merge into the package hopefully over the next few months. So we have code ready, or we have code written, it's just not quite ready to be put into the library. I think so, yeah. I'm not connected to that, no. Um, which means I'm probably duplicating a lot of effort, but I, I wanted to expose for people who are hesitant to move from MATLAB because of Comp Econ's approach to function approximation. I wanted to present that in Julia. So I, I'd probably have to do some significant wrapping of that package to present a similar uh, behavior. That, I actually am not entirely sure how it happened. So John Soczerski, one of the lead developers of the Quant Econ project, he sent me an email a few months ago and said, hey, these guys are interested in doing it. What do you think? And we've been communicating over the past few months. Um, so I actually don't know what the impetus was or where it came from. But it's a huge model. It's going to be a significant uh, amount of code. But I'm excited to see how it, how it progresses. They've already moved over some of like the setup for how the model's constructed and represented. And from my point of view, or from my, in my opinion, it's already a significant improvement over what they were doing. So I think they're going to be pretty happy with it. One last question. Yeah, is there any issues reporting in that lab code um, legally in terms of um, moving it into open source? So we've talked to both uh, Mario Miranda and Paul Fackler about using their code, and, and they're okay with that. Um, so we have had to take licensing issues into consideration as we're doing this. And, and most of the work is, is unique and, and new. It just happens that this is based off of code that they wrote. So we did have to, take, to deal with that issue. Okay, thanks.